Hey all, it's Jerome Taylor from Eastgate Baptist Church and it's time for Midweek at Eastgate where we spend time in prayer and study of the word together. Just kind of a midweek pausing point but also launching point for the rest of the week. Yes, it's Wednesday and that has its own complexities depending on where you are right now in the middle of our COVID circumstance. We are now at July 1st and guess what? If we make it through today, we have made it halfway through the year 2020. And I know some people say, well, shouldn't that be July, June 30th? Shouldn't that have been the midway point? But it's leap year. So remember, that's another element of the 2020 surprise. So we are on day 183 and we only have 183 more to go. And so I'm excited about what that means for us as we're together. So tonight we are going to spend some time in prayer. And as we prepare our hearts to do that, first of all, I want to invite you, if you would like to uh, have your request made known, you can certainly comment in our little uh, element line there, and we will certainly pray for one another together. But you may also um, send us a message and uh, you may email us through connect at eastgatebaptist.org. Uh, those are elements, ways that you can do that if you do not wish to have it in the comment line for all the world to see, uh, or at least for our Facebook group uh, and that kind of thing. You can certainly get on in that way. Uh, a couple other things we want to be praying for. Uh, certainly we are working towards uh, cultivating a system where we show people our care and, and think about how we carefully come back together. Uh, we just finished our fourth Sunday back and it has been a, an incredible blessing each week. Hi Pete and Krista. Um, hi James, by the way, I saw you were there earlier. And uh, it has been a beautiful time that we've been together. Very sweet fellowship, uh, very encouraging. Each week we see new faces coming back and returning to be with us, singing songs of praise together, uh, spending time in prayer with one another, uh, spending time learning through the word together. So we're, I want you to continue praying for us as we work on all of those elements. Certainly, we, we want to continue growing and, and bringing back some of the ministries that we had uh, and, and readjusting others to best fit the need for the mission. That's, that's a work of the church to help people grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and to bring him glory. So what we do, how we do that, uh, the message does not change, but sometimes the methods have to be tweaked for uh, where we are currently as a people, where we are currently in our community, and so we're looking at all those adjustments. So pray for your church leaders as we look at all that. Um, certainly there's some scares about what's going on in our community right now. I see some of the, uh, the institutions that some people frequent are being shut down. Some of them are being extended for their closures at this point. So uh, we know that provides a rocky turmoil for many because their job may depend on certain places being open and they have not yet opened or they are closing back and uh, particularly certain restaurants and that kind of thing. So we're praying for all of those working in those areas. But tonight, as we spend time in prayer, uh, I want to focus on a key word. A key word is, well, it's a, a word that is placed in key for what we're going to be looking at. And tonight's word is willingness. Willingness. Um, we know that the Lord's Prayer was a part of that model is that we pray that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we know that Jesus said uh, in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. Hi, Cheryl. So glad that you're here. And, and I want to say thank you for everyone that's tuning in uh, Facebook Live. You guys are awesome. Uh, we will be posting this on YouTube later, and you may not be watching this live, but we're grateful for anyone that would give the moment to tune in today. Um, but willingness is, is our key word that I want us to focus in. What does, what does willingness mean for you? What does it mean when it comes to your submission to the Lord? And what I mean by this, I think all of us as Christians, we want to be able to answer and say, I am willing to do whatever the Lord would lead me to do. 
And, and I, I, that's something I'm convicted of in my own life. I, I want that to be true in my own life. But being honest about that, while the desire to do the Lord's will is there, the doing it and the reason behind doing it is often blurred. And I, I don't know if that's where you are in your life, but uh, as we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, we're going to see how Paul calls himself a prisoner of the Lord. And Paul was not a perfect human being, but we're going to be looking at his life and how he submitted to the Lord, even though it cost him greatly. He was willing. Um, even though it would require suffering on his part, he was willing. Even though it would require him to do the hard things, he was willing. So as we're thinking about this key word of willingness tonight and, and what it means as we surrender and submit to the Lord in his will above all things, do you have any caveats that you say, yes, I'm willing, but like I'm willing, but I want the approval. I, I'm willing, but I need the affirmation. I'm willing but only so much as it doesn't cause me pain. I'm willing as long as I don't have to sacrifice any of my current status or possessions or lifestyle. I'm willing to do whatever, but do we tag a little but at the end? But I need this to make it happen. I think for us as Christians, our prayer needs to be, Lord, I'm willing, but where I fight that against that, I need your help. I need you to walk with me. I need your spirit to dwell with me because as much as I want to, the will and will do it, sometimes is a struggle. So let's take some time to pray. Like I said, if you have any prayer requests and you want to make, sure, make them known in front of others, you can certainly comment and share those. If you do not want everyone else to know, you can email us through connect at eastgatebaptist.org or you can certainly message us whenever you're seeing this through uh, Facebook. And uh, that will be a way for you to share your prayer request. Hello, Kayla. Hello, Cheryl. Hello, uh, Pete and Krista. Hello, James and Jim. Uh, those that have been tuning in with us tonight in this moment. Um, and we're grateful for anyone else that will tune in. And like I said, this is going to be recorded, it is being recorded, and will be posted later on YouTube as well. So you may not be watching it live, but I want you to let you know, even though I may not see your name, I'm very grateful that you're giving us this moment. So let's take some time to pray together. Once again, that key word, willingness. Are we truly willing to follow the Lord in costly ways uh, out of an overflow and a gratitude for what his grace has done in our life? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I am, I am indeed grateful for you. Uh, I, I should not even have the right to do this, to even get online and, and share the message of who, who you are. But were it not for grace that uh, rescued this lost sinner, that uh, continually is working in my life, I am not yet perfect, and uh, you are working within me. To, to teach me more and more about who you are, uh, to recognize where um, I do things sometimes because I want to and it's out of my pride with, and not based on who you are and based on your work of grace. But I'm thankful that, that grace is still there and that you work even those things to your good. But I pray that you would continue working on me. I'm thankful that you have not left this world without a witness. Your church is here so that we can help people in the middle of a hurting time, a confusing time, a time that needs clarity, a time that needs peace and hope and, and your love and truth. I'm thankful that you have not left us uh, without your witness. And more importantly, you have not left us alone. You say for all of those who come to you that place their faith in who you are, you dwell with us through the Spirit within our individual bodies as believers. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. And, and I don't always understand what all that means. 
but I know it's the promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. So God, tonight, as we talk about what it means to work and be willing, particularly to serve you and, and to speak out uh, your word, I pray that you would help us to grow in our understanding of you, that we would uh, be encouraged. We would see that all of this is done not to guilt us, but to show us the extravagant grace of your son, Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, have your way in this time. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So, we are moving forward in our letter, uh, looking through the letter of Ephesians. So, if you want to go ahead and turn there and in your copy of the scriptures, please feel free to do so. Uh, we're going to be in the third chapter of Ephesians, but remember, this is just for our sake, looking at these numbers, the big number and the little number uh, with the little colon in the middle. Uh, that is just for study and for us to stay together. Um, but this was a letter written in its entirety to the church at Ephesus. And, and usually these letters were not only read in the one church, but they were taken and copied and shared with multiple churches. And the Lord has preserved this so that we might know him and follow him and trust him and grow with him. But not only that we would do that, but that we as his followers would communicate what it means to be his child, to be his follower, to be his disciple. And here Paul is writing this letter. Now, he's writing it in a unique circumstance. Uh, this is considered one of the prison epistles, prison letters. Paul is writing this from prison. Now, whether this is whenever he was in Caesarea, uh, Caesarea by the sea, or whether or not this was whenever he was um, in Rome, we are not sure. They're pretty close together because Paul would spend a total of five years in prison. Five years in prison. Think about the length of time that is. That is an immense amount of time. Um, for particularly for the fact that he's doing it because he was being persecuted for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the Savior not only to the children of God as the Jewish people, but to all nations. Uh, we're going to look at it in a minute, ago, in a minute um, that this message of preaching on behalf of the Gentiles, preaching to the rest of the world, was the reason that he was really uh, rioted against reason he was really imprisoned. Yes, the message of Jesus Christ was central to it, but there were many people in Jerusalem that were preaching about Jesus and they did not face the imprisonment that Paul would face. Eventually, persecution would break out upon all, but Paul really was ridiculed and imprisoned because his gospel went beyond just Jewish heritage toward beyond people just like him, that spoke and talked just like him. It was a gospel to all that the Lord was fulfilling his promises through the people of Abraham, the line of Abraham, that through his descendants, all nations would be blessed. But many times people don't want to hear that. So we're looking at this, and, and as we look at it, I want to quote to you one of my favorite theologians and pastors, uh, kind of a hero in my own life. Uh, well, not my own life. I read about him because he didn't live whenever, he's not alive at any point that I've been living. Uh, but a, a pastor from the Victorian age, so the 1800s, mid-1800s uh, in England, uh, Charles Spurgeon. And so not for, unfamiliar for me to quote from Spurgeon. Um, you see his little bobblehead right there behind me kind of thing, you know. Yeah, 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 I got weird stuff in my office. But this is what he said about the mission and willingness. He says, of, of every Christian here on earth is either a missionary or an imposter. And I know that's really bold and that's really tugging and, and like kind of jabbing. He says, you either try to spread abroad the kingdom of Christ or else you do not love him at all. It cannot be that there is a high appreciation of Jesus and a totally silent tongue about him. He also said this, If there be any one point in which Christ, the Christian church ought to keep its fervor at white heat, it is concerning missions. If there be anything about which we cannot tolerate lukewarmness, it is the matter of sending the gospel to a dying world. He also said my favorite quote by him about how this urgency is there and this willingness on our part should be there. If sinners be damned 
At least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. That there should be this urgent willingness that is here. And as Paul just finished speaking about the immense blessings that are ours who are followers of Jesus, who have received his grace, and it is absolute grace that, uh, that we did nothing on ourselves to deserve it. We were all dead in our sins and trespasses, yet God has brought us to a place of faith. As those who have received it, and we recognize that the gospel is not just for special people, not even just for similar people, but for all those who would receive it. God would give them the right to be called children of God. As that is the message, he says, for this, this is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. He's saying, for all these things I have laid out before, this is why I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He says, for this reason, I want to let you know this is happening. He's not hiding the fact that he's in a very unique and what the world would say devastating situation. But he doesn't want that to bring people down. He says in verse 13, so then I ask you not to be discouraged over my afflictions on your behalf, for they are for your glory. They are your glory. So Paul is writing to this church in Ephesus, predominantly a Gentile church with some Jewish believers, and speaking about how they have every right of grace that, that anyone of a Jewish bloodline would have. This is all because of Jesus, all because of his grace. And he says, it is for this reason that I am in prison. It is for this reason that the gospel was proclaimed to the Gentiles, and I am not ashamed of that. I am not reserved or hesitant about that. This is my whole calling in life, that the gospel would be made known to all peoples. And he says, this is why I'm in prison. I make no bones about it, and that's okay. That is okay. Now, I don't think many of us would be okay with being in prison. And Paul's not saying it's the best thing ever. It's the greatest situation ever. And he's not being sarcastic about it. But at the same time, he's not being self-pitying about it. He's not looking for uh, or fishing for affection from the church. He's not trying to present himself as, uh, as a pity party. That is not it. He is thankful even in his situation, even though it be bittersweet. So he says, for this reason, it's the gospel that was proclaimed to the Gentiles that he's in prison. And it's the gospel's consideration for the church that he's writing this. He says, it is the will of Christ Jesus that I am in prison. It is his will, and I am fully willing to follow and obey and surrender to whatever direction he causes me, even if it means I suffer in prison. Because I know it's according to his will. And it will bring glory to the church. He's, he's letting them know that this is going to bring triumph. This is going to bring hope. It's, it's not a lost cause situation. And what he's letting the church know in the meantime, that the gospel will bring us to identify with suffering. And that's where that willingness part comes on our help. Are we willing to follow the gospel? Are we willing to follow Jesus? Even if it means we will go into suffering. In some relation to the world, it will cause suffering because we will deny our flesh and there will be things that God just says no to. He just says no for you and I. And we will think that will be suffering. Are we willing to take that? Well, there will be suffering because we will deny the worldly institutions that are there that, said that, that elevate these things as of greater value and greater worth than Jesus. And we will say no, these possessions whatever they are, even if they are not wrong, are not exalted above Christ. They will bring us 
suffering as we identify with the gospel because we will go against the enemy. The enemy that is trying to tout and bring worship to anything other than Jesus. And Paul says, for this reason, I willingly am here. We don't know what year in prison he was, but he knows he's been there in chains for a while. And he says, for this reason. And he says, I, Paul. For this reason, I, Paul. Not somebody else. I, I, yes, we have other heroes we can tout for the faith. But he says, this is what I'm willing to do. Uh, another one of my heroes uh, that wrote just a, just a beautiful allegory of the Christian journey, uh, Pilgrim's Progress by, by John Bunyan. Uh, there's multiple iterations, copies of this. I recommend it highly. Now, you may want to get an updated language version because it was written in, uh, you know, the mid-centuries uh, the, of, uh, of um, the mid-last centuries after the Reformation, so somewhere in the 16, 1700s, by uh, John Bunyan, uh, the mustachioed wonder John Bunyan. Uh, he, he wrote this in prison. He, he wrote it in prison, but it's an allegory about the, the trials and yet the triumphs that the Christian will face as he's following the Lord, but it will require willingness. It will require surrender. And, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful picture of that. Um, but Paul is not saying, hey, look at that guy over there. And he's not really saying, hey, look at me in here. He's not saying either one of those, but he is saying, as for me, this is what I'm willing to do. Uh, you see that phraseology quite a bit through the scriptures. You see Joshua saying, uh, you know, you can choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my household, this is what we're doing. This is where we're going. And, and that's where the faith becomes personal. It, it's got to be that willingness, not on someone else's behalf or not for someone else, but between you and the Lord, where do you stand? Where are you willing to walk with him? knowing that Christ was not a stranger to suffering. And if we are going to be Christians, followers of Christ, little Christians, we may not go to the cross to die for the sins of the world because you can't repeat that part. But it will require bearing a cross. It will require suffering. The gospel identifies with Jesus. And Paul is saying, I am willing to do this. I, Paul. I, Paul, who was once known as Saul of Tarsus. I, Paul, who was trained as a student under Gamaliel, the rabbi, the famous rabbi of that day. I, I Paul, who was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I, Paul, who, who am a Hebrew by birth. I, Paul, who um, was from the tribe of Benjamin. I, Paul, who is a Roman citizen and, and, and is in, available to all the rights afforded for a Roman citizen. I, Paul, who have all this he was also the Paul that says, I consider all of that dung in comparison to knowing Christ, his suffering and his resurrection. This is the words that Paul would give us. So he's identifying with this and he's willingness to face self-sacrifice with even bittersweet rejoicing. He's not saying, give me trials or give me death. That's not what he's saying. He's not inviting the suffering, but he's willing that whatever Christ would take him, he's willing to go. And he's doing it with rejoicing as he looks at verse 13, that this was for your glory. So what we see in Paul is he's not complaining about his present situation. He knew that was the calling of his life. He doesn't avoid it and pretend it's not there. He's not doing that um, as if it's some stoic thing. Oh, just, just another day. Just I'm not, not a big deal. But also, he doesn't paint it wrongly. He doesn't use it for his own pride. He doesn't use it for his own glory. He uses it for the church's glory. And so, Paul, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner. And he says, I'm not just a ordinary prisoner. Uh, reading different authors. Uh, Martin Lloyd Jones, uh, Tony Morita, different authors from different points in history. You know, they, they really hone into this, and I think this is where we need to be moving in as well. Um, that Paul identifies himself as a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, of, of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus, the Messiah who is Jesus. 
I am his prisoner. Um, I'm not a prisoner of Felix or Festus in Caesarea. Yes, they have authority. I go to trial before them, but I'm not their prisoner. I'm not a prisoner of the Jewish Pharisees that arrested me and had me uh, had a riot to to had me almost had me killed in Jerusalem. I'm not a prisoner of the Roman authorities. I'm not a prisoner of Nero. I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So here's what I want to say. I do not belong to anyone, including myself, but Jesus. I do not belong to anyone but Jesus, and that includes myself. I don't even belong to me. And if he wants to know why he is here, he wants the church to know why he's here, it's because for him, he met Jesus at noonday on the way to Damascus to kill Christians. And Jesus showed him grace, and his life is forever changed. Wherever Christ has intersected with your life, wherever he has met you, even in the middle of the most dire sinfulness, it is a demonstration of his grace that brings transformation. And we belong to no one but Jesus. And so that, that should help resonate with us, I hope, as Christians, particularly in a world, particularly in America, where you, you're, you're meant to belong to a certain label. You know, you may go to a Baptist church, that kind of thing. Uh, but we belong to no kingdom but Christ. We have no allegiance to anyone but Jesus. That is, that is our creed. We are citizens of heaven. We are children of God. And should it be his will, we are prisoners of Christ. That If that is the Lord's will, that is our direction. And it is the testimony of that suffering, though. The paradox of it, the, the twisting of it is this. That the testimony of suffering affords a different witness to a follower of Jesus. You see, when we're unwilling to face the hard times or do the hard things or unwilling to suffer and, and walk as a child of God through those valleys, wherever they may be, it inhibits our witness. It, 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 it downplays it. You know, we think the best testimony of of being a Christian is some kind of celebrity status. That's why when we see celebrities that start talking about Jesus, we get really, really excited. We just do. But the best testimony ever is not someone that invites and, and like tries to conjure up suffering. You know, they're not being a jerk and saying, help, help, I'm being repressed, I'm being persecuted. That's not what we're meant to do. But when it comes and we face it with fortitude, with fervency for the Lord, knowing that God, even this, you have not let it escape your eye. It is a part of your written will for my life. Those that see that, it opens their ears and says, well, what they believe must be genuine. At least it's genuine for them. And it continues bringing a different curiosity that you would be willing to go through this. You see, Paul... He didn't have to be there. Think about it. He could have just said, you know what? I made it up. It's not that big of a deal to me. Um, he could have said, I'll, I'll never preach to someone aside from the Jewish people ever again. Uh, I'll never travel. Um, it really could have been that easy for him to say, you know what? I, I wash my hands of this. I, I give up this. I don't have to sit in suffering. I don't have to be in this prison. But that's not where he's at. He's willing to take it. Why? And that's the last part, because the mission of the message. He said, this is on behalf of you Gentiles. This is on behalf of the nations. This is on behalf of those who do not have the same languages and creeds and cultures as I do. Hi, Tim. Um, he is willing on behalf of them to sacrifice self, to be willing to follow whatever direction the Lord would lead so that the peoples of every tribe, nation, and tongue that he could reach in his lifetime would hear the gospel. That was his goal. 
He is saying, this is what I'm willing to suffer for you. So do not be discouraged. Do not take this and say, we're to blame for this. Do not take this and say, oh, whoa, it was me, poor Paul, uh, and, and all these kind of things, or elevate me as a hero. I, he says, I am willing to do this because I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am doing this on your behalf so that you might know him. So that you might walk and continue this journey walking with him. This is what willingness looks like, and this is what the end matter is. Willingness, willingness to be carriers of the message, all for the mission of Jesus, shows our affection towards Jesus. It shows that we really worship him. Come hell or high water, we are willing. Not because we're special, not because we just have a higher uh, zealously, zealousness than anybody else. No, it's because we recognize this is what Jesus has done for me. So I will walk with him. Wherever he leads, I am willing to go. That's where we're at tonight. I, I hope this has been uh, encouraging to you. I hope it's been challenging. I hope that you see that all of this is because of the gospel. It's not something that we're trying to form some legalistic list of works and duties that you're supposed to lead up to. No, it's because you recognize this is what Jesus did for me, that he, the holy God, would see me in the offense of my sin and he would take on flesh to live the perfect life that I was not able to live, but to die the death that I should have died. And based on what he has done, I, you, anyone who listens, must personally respond to the message of the gospel. No figure, no parent, no family could ever do this for you. It must be between you and Jesus. But when we encounter him, and he intersects our life, we have that collision with Jesus, if you will, even right where we are, even as sinners, our life is forever changed. Not only where we're going, but what we're doing in the here and now that says, I am willing to follow wherever Jesus would lead. We all love that message from Isaiah 6, I think, about the Lord being seen in the temple high and lifted up. And he says, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. But if you read past the here I am, send me, you see that the mission that God gave Isaiah was very difficult. But yet it brought glory to Jesus' name and it brought nations to respond to him. That is our calling today. It may be hard work that he calls us to, but it is worth it so that those who respond to the grace of Jesus, just as we have, could have that glory just as we do. That's what our key word is tonight, willingness. I hope this has been a blessing. If we can help you in any way take your next step with Jesus, please reach out and connect with us. We would love to have that conversation. You could comment or you can message us through Facebook. You can email us, connect at eastgatebaptist.org. And if you're in the Flint, Michigan area, we would love to carry on that conversation one-on-one. Please check us out at eastgatebaptist.org. And that's a way for you to connect with us. Until next time, this has been our midweek Bible study and prayer. And I hope it's been beneficial to you. We'll continue online tomorrow night for Theology Thursdays at 7.30. Till then, hasta luego.